Ja, hallå. Ehm, välkomna allihopa och jätte, jättekul att det var så många som ville komma hit och lyssna på vårt lilla event. Ehm, jag är här som representant för 3D Center och jag heter Ulf Kviberg. Ehm, vi, jag tänkte kort presentera vad vi håller på med för någonting och därefter så kommer IUC och presentera lite kort vad de är för några. Och efter det så kommer Phil komma upp och göra sin presentation. Vi är, det här är vi som håller på med 3D Center. Det är Kasper och jag som sitter på kontoret här nere i Västvik. Och sen är det Anders som är vår säljare som utgår från Falun. Lotta sköter administration och Jonas och Roger är delägare i bolaget och sitter med i styrelsen. Vår samarbetspartner, viktigaste samarbetspartner är 3D Systems. De är världens största tillverkare och utvecklare av 3D-skrivare. Så vi är väldigt glada för att ha fått chansen att samarbeta med dem. Och det är bara vi och ett företag till uppe i Stockholm som säljer just de här maskinerna. Okej, okay, well thank you for the warm welcome. And thank you all for, for being here. And thank you for you guys for, for organizing this and to Ulf and the, the guys at 3D Center who I've just had a wonderful lunch with. So uh, if one thing, I've had a good lunch, and that's, that's important to an Englishman uh, at this time in the afternoon. So, Okay, so what I want to do is, is spend, I think the slide says an hour and a half. It's not going to be an hour and a half. This is far too long. I'm going to spend maybe 50 minutes talking to you about 3D printing, uh, which is something I'm very passionate about. So I will start jumping and getting really excited. So I, I make no apologies. I'm very passionate about this technology, and hopefully by the end of this presentation, you you will also be passionate about the idea of 3D printing uh, and what it can do. I'm going to give you an introduction to myself and the company that I run, tell you a little bit about some of the things we do uh, and the, the sorts of projects that we get involved with uh, to give you an idea of what's happening in the world of 3D printing. Uh, I want to talk about applications because these are just machines. I'm going to show you machines. It's up to you to decide what to do with those machines. And we can use them in very different ways. We can use them for prototypes. We can use them for manufacturing. We can use them if we're an architect, we can use them if we're a doctor or a dentist. Lots of different ways. Uh, I'm going to talk about business. This is really important to me. Technology is useless unless it makes money. So we're going to talk about economics, we're going to talk about how 3D printing adds value to companies. Uh, and the future, we'll look to the future. Where is all of this technology leading us? Uh, and how could it change the way that we do things? And then at the end we'll have some, some questions, some easy questions, hopefully. Not too difficult. It will be very late in the afternoon by the time we finish, so easy is good. Uh, so as, as I was introduced earlier, um, the company I run is a 3D printing consultancy. We've been involved in this industry for 20 years. So as much as the media will tell you this is a new industrial revolution, it is all very new and it is going to revolutionize the way we do things, this technology is not so new. It's been around for quite some time. It's only recently that companies have started to really understand the value and the power We formed our company 10 years ago uh, really to help businesses around the world understand not how to use this to prototype or to product develop, but to use it to make products, mainstream manufacturing. Use this to displace the things that we traditionally do. And, and over the years, we've developed an interesting team of people. We have engineers, as you would expect, and designers. We have economists working for us, industrial economists, trying to work out, is 3D printing better than machining? Is it better than molding? Does it make more sense? We have software developers. And interestingly now, we have retail and HR is human resources. People who understand about jobs and skills and people. So if I told you one of the projects we have at the moment is looking at putting 3D printers into the high street of every chemist store in the UK. Three and a half thousand pharmacies with 3D printers. Okay, that's a lot of 3D printers making a lot of products. But the people who work in those pharmacy stores are retail workers. They're not manufacturing people. And all of a sudden, we're telling them that they have to start making things. So the union jumps up and down and says, no, can't do that. We work in retail. We don't work in manufacture. So the world is changing. So we, we have people who understand this and work with our clients. We have a partnership with a big university in the UK where we have a laboratory where we develop new mach machines, materials. Uh, and we are very global in terms of our, our customer base. We spend our life working with three different types of company. One is businesses that want to use 3D printing. 
They want to make products using 3D printing. And that might be a medical product, could be part of an aircraft, uh, it could be part of uh, a consumer good, could be part of an electronics product. We help companies who try to make 3D, 3D printing machines because they don't often know really what industry wants. Some of these companies have been making 3D printing machines for 20 years, but they don't ask manufacturers what manufacturers need. So we help them understand what's needed in the technology. And we also work with the investment community. Uh, there is a lot of interest in 3D printing. There is a lot of hype, a lot of media coverage, but there is also genuine interest in developing the 3D printing economy. So I'll give you uh, just four projects that we're working on at the moment. Uh, the first one is kind of interesting for us, working with IBM. IBM came to us and said, in 10 years' time, we don't think anything will be made in the Far East. We want to make everything in North America again. We don't want to pay low-cost labor in, in China. We want manufacturing in a high-wage economy. And we think 3D printing is the solution to that. OK, that's an interesting idea. But how do we prove it? So we spent quite some time in the last year looking with IBM at a range of electronics products. And I'll share some of them with you later and saying what would happen if a 3D printer was connected to a robot? And what if they worked together? What if they made products? BMW, we've been working with for some time now, um, looking at what happens if BMW's computer files get out onto the internet. What happens when people try to print their own BMW components? What happens when somebody prints BMW components and then tries to sell them as being BMW components? Because we can do that now. What's the implication to BMW? What's the economic implication, the social implication? What does it do to their brand if my BMW falls to pieces, only to discover that the parts were printed by somebody down the road and not by BMW? So these are the way people are, are addressing uh, 3D printing. We have some work with Autodesk. Nike is very interesting. So don't think 3D printing is all about engineering. It's also about textiles. It's about footwear. So Nike love the idea of 3D printing shoes. We can't do it yet. Technologically, we can't do it. But the idea and the concept of being able to print a product for a consumer is very compelling to a company like Nike. And I guess the reason for this slide is to say those are very big brand names. But all this technology is applicable to the smallest company as much as it is to the largest company. So 3D printing, uh, an industry overview. I'm going to spend, I guess, 40 minutes going through a very quick overview of this whole industry, how it works, how you can engage with it, how you can use it, the different technology, uh, the different applications for this technology. So a video is always a good start. I always like to describe 3D printing machines as automated two-dimensional printers. They're just two-dimensional printers with another axis. They, rather than deposit ink, deposit plastic or deposit metal and they build parts just in the same way that you print a document. So at the moment, you type away in Word, you write your report, you hit print, you transfer that digital data to paper. With 3D printing, you design a product, you hit print, you translate it into a three-dimensional object. And all these technologies are, are ostensibly three-dimensional printing machines. I think it's worth just explaining that we have lots and lots of different descriptions that all mean the same thing. So in the media, I'm sure you will hear two terms. You will hear additive manufacturing, and you will hear 3D printing. They are the same thing. You'll also hear additive layer manufacturing, direct digital manufacturing, rapid manufacturing. It all means the same thing. It means take data, 3D data, print product. That's ultimately what all these things are. Ulf shared with you a, a video earlier, and I'll, I'll explain in a little more detail how this all works. All of our printing processes have to have digital data. So if you guys still use two-dimensional data, two-dimensional drawings, that's not the starting point for us. The starting point for the 3D printing world is three-dimensional data. Now, it can come from CAD software, and that could be expensive, high-end CAD software like Katia or SolidWorks, or you could do it on Google, Google SketchUp is probably the easiest entry place that you could create a 3D file. But we don't have to have computer data from, from design. We can take MRI scans from hospitals, CT scans from hospitals. Any three-dimensional computer data is a starting point for 3D printing. And when we have our data, we put it into some software tools, and we decide how we're going to build this object, what's the best way, which will give us the best quality or the most cost-effective component part. 
And then, as we saw in the earlier video, we slice this part up digitally. We turn it from three dimensions to two. And then we deal with these two-dimensional layers of information, print them one on top of the other, layer by layer by layer by layer, until hopefully, if the system works, and these guys will testify it doesn't always work, does it? No. If it works, we end up with a solid three-dimensional object. That's the principle. It's a really, really very, very simple idea. But it's very different. Think about how you make things now. If you're a manufacturing company and you're involved in manufacturing, think about the difference here. Most things you make are subtractive. Yeah? And you've done that for two and a half million years. It's not been very innovative, have we? A CNC machine is not much different to a caveman. You take a piece of material and you hit it with something and bits fall off and you end up with a product. And that's machining. We still do it. And the caveman did it quite well. Fabrication. You take pieces of material, you combine them together against some sort of design, and you end up with a product. And we've been doing that for 8,000 years. F formative manufacture is a five, I guess, yeah, 5,000 year old process. Investment casting. Take some wax, dip it in ceramic, melt the wax, pour some gold. Hey, you have a gold casting. So 5,000 years. So we've gone from 2.5 million to 5,000 years. We didn't really change much in manufacturing until 1984, when an odd race of people called Californians, they're very strange looking, they invented this idea of layer manufacturing. And really, the reason behind this, 1984, is quite, it's quite an important date. What happened in 1984 was computer power increased to the point where we could control three-dimensional data, and lasers became affordable and accessible. And all of a sudden, somebody connected a laser to a computer and worked out a way of scanning a laser on some resin. And wherever the, the laser touches the resin, it turns it into a solid. That's the invention of 3D printing. Now, it couldn't have happened earlier because we didn't have the computer power. We didn't have the lasers. So that is, what's that, nearly 30 years ago. 29 years ago, this was invented as a concept. A lot has happened, an awful lot. If you look at patents, the earliest pattern I've ever found was 1902 for layer manufacturing, making things layer by layer by layer by layer. And the first thing we ever found was a horseshoe. And that's interesting if you, if you read that patent. Why would you make a horseshoe out of layers? Because you can improve how far your horse can walk. If you sandwich layers of fabric and metal and fabric and metal and fabric and metal, you make a soft shoe for your horse. And your horse will walk further through the day. And keep that in the back of your mind, because that's important, because that's what we're trying to do with 3D printing today. Make better products that have more value that you can sell for a higher price. So here we are, after 100 years. Some interesting things happened. In 2011, there were about 45,000 layer manufacturing machines in the world had ever been sold since Chuck sold the first one in 1984. Last year... 45,000 machines were sold. We doubled the install base of machines in a year. This year, we expect that to go to near 100,000. So this industry is starting to grow exponentially year upon year upon year for a number of reasons. One, the technology is more accessible. Two, the technology is far more capable. It is more useful and applicable. I won't bore you with all the different ways you can make additive parts, but there are lots and lots of different types of technology Everything based on making layers. But we can do it with chemicals, we can do it with thermal energy, electron beams, lasers, extrude, jet. Lots and lots of different ways of making things. They all work in the same principle. Layer by layer, adding material. And lots of different technology vendors. Um, the guys here in, in, uh, in Vastavik are, are very heavily involved with 3D systems, who are the largest of all of these vendors, who have probably the widest portfolio of technologies. Uh, both metal and polymer-based technologies. But also, a really broad range of prices for these technologies. The cheapest 3D printer you can buy is 200 US dollars. I would not suggest you go and buy it. It's a bad idea. Because what it makes really doesn't resemble your computer file. However, if you want to go and spend a million dollars, you can buy yourself a fantastic 3D printing machine that's capable of making uh, medical implants that you could give to a surgeon in the local hospital who could put them directly into a human body made from a medical grade polymer. So we can go from one end, an extreme, right to the other. And in the middle, we have a whole range of different technologies of different prices. 
This is where it gets interesting and important, I think. After 25 years, what we also have is lots of different material. When we started 20 years ago, there was one material. There was one plastic material uh, that we could print with, and it was dreadful. It was really very bad. We would print our prototype, and then we would run to the product development guys and say, here it is, here it is, use it quickly, because it won't be here tomorrow. Because by tomorrow, it will have broken, it will have distorted and warped and cracked. Uh, and if you were anywhere in a warm environment, so it doesn't apply here, if you're in southern Europe, it would absorb moisture. So in a warm environment, anywhere with UV, with sunlight, so again, not here, uh, it would <laughs> absorb lots and lots of UV, it would distort, it would warp, it would soak up moisture, and it would be useless. And you would have paid 20 years ago three or four thousand dollars for a prototype that big. Yeah, if these guys try and charge you more than 30 or 40 dollars for something this big, they're profiteering, okay? So, so the world's moved on, and the technology is far better than it used to be. And this is where we are today. We have the ability to make products in different materials. Ceramic material, which I know that the, the 3D Center guys have a ceramic-based uh, machine. We have organic material like waxes, which I think, again, you can print with. So if you want to make patterns for casting, you can make a casting pattern. Polymers and metals, really important. We have lots of engineering polymers we can print with now. Um, Thermosetting epoxy materials, engineering polymers like polycarbonate, ABS, polyamide, nylon. So things that are used within engineering, we can print in. In the last five or six years, the, the big development in our world has been the ability to print directly in metal. So I can now take titanium, I, I can take tool steel, I can take engineering materials that are used in aircraft like Inconel, and I can make parts. I can make direct parts for a jet engine, for example. And that's a big step forward in our, our 3D printing world. So these are the different materials that we have. As I said, we use them, and we use these machines for different things. It is just a machine. It's how you apply the machine that fundamentally makes money in your business. And there are four ways you can use a 3D printing machine. The first one is making prototypes. And this is by far the biggest and probably the most important at the moment. I can make patterns for casting. I can make tools. I can make direct parts. So I'm going to give you some examples here. So prototypes. If you think about a business, who needs a prototype in a business? It stretches right the way across the whole organization. Your marketing guys would love to have a prototype. They'd love to be able to take a physical object to customers and say, hey guys, this is what we're thinking of making. Is this what you want? Engineers, if you're an engineer being given a set of drawings and told to make something, it's quite hard. It's quite difficult. Being given a model and a set of drawings is quite valuable. One thing that we do a lot of with, with our clients is use models to send them to suppliers. So rather than just send a disk to a supplier or email data to a supplier, we also send a model and say, hey guys, quote for this. Because invariably the quotes are lower because they understand what they're actually making, not what we're asking them or what they think they're going to be making. Presentation marketing models, architectural models. I'll give you some examples. This is a, a quite a nice complex part. This is part of a Formula One car. Uh, and the whole purpose of this model is to work out where to put the wiring. So the, the wiring that you see on there is the actual wiring that goes on the car. But they couldn't afford to wait to make an exhaust pipe to start designing the wiring. So they print out the exhaust pipe, design the wiring, while they're making the exhaust, bring the two together. Yes, it's expensive, but it's engineering insurance. That's what they're buying. They're buying the ability to compress the supply chain, reduce the lead time. Fit and functional models, again, the accuracy that we can achieve with these technologies lets us make parts that we can make together with other parts. We can make assemblies, we can test our designs to make sure that we haven't made errors. Proof of concept, it's quite hard sometimes, even using 3D rendering and, and, and software to get a concept across to people. Having a tangible thing in your hand is very, very valuable. Quotation request models, as I said, the idea of sending somebody a part and saying, this is actually what I want. So when you quote, you're not quoting just to a drawing, you're quoting to an object, a thing. Presentation and marketing, 
Um, and I'm sure if you, if you come back to the, uh, to, to the center later, you'll see some great presentation models and marketing models. You can do some wonderful things with 3D printed parts. You can paint them, you can metalize them, you can polish them, coat them. You don't just have to think of it being the part that comes from the machine. You can do other things to it, put transfers on, put painting on, and all sorts of things. That actually looks like a shoe, doesn't it? It's not a shoe, it's a 3D printed shoe. So that's the sort of resolution that you can get with these machines. OK, you're not going to get your foot in it, because it's made of ceramic, and it's going to hurt. And it's also going to break. But it looks like a shoe. Nike have 17 of those machines. And every shoe that they ever make and commission, they print. Oh, and also 12 of their suppliers in the Far East also have machines. Because when Nike places an order, it sends a file first and says, this is what you're going to be making. So that's how some larger companies use this technology. They talk about it as being a 3D fax machine. That's what they're doing, sending 3D data for other people to print and look at. Architectural models, we're seeing more and more architects using 3D design. And architects have always used models, but they've always made them manually. So this technology is perfect in architecture. As more and more architects start using uh, 3D design software, so let's go back to this slide. Why do you need million pound machines? Why can't we just all go and buy a $200 machine and, and be done with it? I want to just give you a, a little word of warning about some of this technology. There's an awful lot of talk and a lot of hype about these low-end consumer 3D printers. Uh, apparently, we're all going to have them in our homes within about another week, I think. Um, and you know we're going to make everything. We're going to print everything out. Amazon's going to go out of business. Um, the high street will just disappear, and everything will be printed at home, because that's what the media says is going to happen. Okay, it's complete nonsense. We we've done two benchmarking trials this year for for two different car companies, and they came to us and said, "We think these home three D printers are amazing. We want to put one on the desk of every designer in our business." And in the case of one of these companies, they have three thousand designers. So some sales guy is jumping up and down, thinking he's about to sell 3,000 machines. Okay? And they come to us and say, is it worth it? Will this make us more innovative? Or will it make us less innovative? Will we start designing things so we can print them? Or will we use printers to actually make our designs better? So we ran a, a benchmarking trial with their parts, real parts, real bits of cars. And we used a range of different consumer 3D printers and some professional 3D printers. And it's interesting what comes off the other end. Some really very poor quality parts. So when you see all these wonderful 3D printed consumer parts in the media, that's because the product has been designed to be printed on a consumer 3D printer. Now, if you're an engineer, you don't want to do that. You want the printer to support you as a designer. You're not going to redesign the way you make a car or um, I'm looking at your slides up there. Who did we have there? So you're not going to make a, a chainsaw based around the design that you know you can 3D print. You're going to design a good chainsaw and use a printer to support your prototyping. So just a word of warning about consumer 3D printers. They're not that useful to industry. And also, they're very expensive. When you work out the cost of parts on these $1,000 MakerBot machines, they take so long and they fail so often. I think if you look here, we had to make yeah, two parts on each of these machines, or certainly on the, on the MakerBot. Every time we tried to print a part, it failed. We had to print another one, another one. It took us days and days to get one part. So just be very wary of consumer 3D printers. Um, get professional parts. It's cheaper. Go and get a professional company to make professional RP parts for you. Um, consumer 3D printers are kind of fun, and my son loves his, and it's all, it's all lovely, but they're not engineering tools yet. They will be one day. Uh, and when they do, I hope these guys sell them, because otherwise it'll be slightly worrying, because we won't need any of the other technology. We'll all be able to do this at home. And, but that's not now. That's in the future, five years, if not longer, 10 years. Casting patterns. I can't make everything yet with my 3D printer. I can make quite a lot of different metal parts, but I can't make every metal part. So one of the important things is to think about this, tool, this technology as a tool. I could use it to do something else. So one thing I could do is make patterns. So if I'm in the casting industry, if I want metal parts, why don't I print out a casting pattern? I could print it in ceramic and pour metal into it. I don't have to make the metal part. 
I could make the pattern. So again, a different way of using the technology. I could make a wax part. I could print in wax, dip it in ceramic, build up a ceramic shell, and use this for investment casting. So again, compressing the supply chain, reducing lead time. But here, not by making a, a, a prototype or an end-use part, but by making a pattern. Tool cavities. Sometimes I want to make a plastic part quickly, but I can't do it with 3D printing because I don't have the right type of plastic. I only have a limited number of polymers. So one thing I can do is, is 3D print a tool. I can make an injection mold tool. Now, it has some limitations. So whenever you look at a 3D part, you'll see it has quite a rough surface. And if I make a tool, then that rough surface is in the tool. And if I mold into the tool, I will copy the rough surface on all the parts I make. So there are some limitations. But one thing I can do is make inserts that go in tools. So I can make very productive tools. Um, anyone, is anyone involved in injection molding? OK, so cycle times, big issue in injection molding. If you look at the cost of, of parts made by molding, the thing that governs the cost is the cycle time. How quickly can I make the machine produce components? And the speed of an injection mold tool is governed by how quickly it heats up and how quickly it cools down. And the quicker I can heat it up and cool it down, the faster I can make it open and close. Now, when you make an injection mold tool, you heat it up and cool it down by running either oil or water through it, through different channels, hot water, cold water, hot water, cold water. One of the things we can do is 3D print those channels in the tool just under the surface. And by doing that, we can make the tool very productive. We can heat it up very quickly, cool it down very quickly. Um, from an economic development point of view, it's not so good. So I'll give you an example. Lego, across the water, uh, used to have 600 injection molding machines and now have 300. Because they can get the same productivity from half the number of machines. Because they run them twice as fast. Because they can heat and cool the tools much, much quicker. So you don't need the same number of machines to get the same production capacity. So maybe not so good for employment, but it's pretty good for economics. I'm going to give you a gruesome example of 3D printing. So dental braces. So this might seem a little bit different to injection molding, but bear with me. Dental braces. It's about a $2 billion a year marketplace, dental braces. The horrible things, if you've ever had them. I had them when I was little. They're horrible. Um, they're expensive. And the whole business model of dental braces, if you actually look at it, is really a not very nice business model. So you have, a, you have a little boy, he needs dental braces, you go to the dentist, the dentist looks at him and says, OK, I'll put some braces in, you have to come back in a month. Come back in a month. And you come back. And this goes on for two years, OK? So some clever guys in the States said, there's got to be a better way of doing this. Why do you have to keep going back to the dentist? Can we have a solution where you only go once? And then the dentist says, not very good for me, is it? So you say, OK, how about a solution where you charge the parents more money, but they only have to come back once? Ah, perfect. Everybody wins. And that's the 3D printing approach to dental braces. So what we do now, and a number of companies do this, a line, clear step, is take a scan of the inside of the patient's mouth. So digitally scan all the teeth. And then transfer it into a computer program. And then look at where all the teeth are and then manipulate the teeth. So change the position on screen to where you want them to be. And then let some software work out how do you get from one to the other safely? How do you have to bend the teeth? And you go through a series of steps, 10 steps, 20 steps, 30, 40, if you've got really, really bad teeth. And then what we do is 3D print a tool. And then we vacuum form over the tool and make a plastic clear dental aligner and put it in a box with a date on the side, January, February, March, April, May, June. Put it in the post. There you go. That's just changed the whole business model for dentists, for parents, for children, because that's a much nicer thing to have in your mouth. You can't see it. It's invisible. You can take it out. You can brush your teeth. Why am I telling you this? It's about business development and opportunity. So Align Technologies was a, a company that started doing this in 1989. New business startup. Didn't exist. A couple of dentists saw this opportunity. So far, they made 80 million dental aligners this way by 3D printing them. 
Last year they shipped, well in 2011, they shipped over 300,000 sets of dental aligners uh, for one and a half thousand dollars per set. So they've gone from nothing to about half a billion. In fact, this year I think their turnover was about 600 million US dollars. Just making dental aligners, and every single one's made by 3D printing, making a tool and vacuum forming. That is their business. It's all based on 3D printing. Direct part manufacture. I said I'd get really excited. <laughs> this is me getting excited, okay? This is the bit that interests me, because I'm an engineer, and I look at most engineering processes, and I still keep going back to thinking, why two and a half million years are we still machining things? Why aren't we just printing things? Why can't we just make products? And Obviously, there are huge limitations to 3D printing, but there are huge opportunities. So I'll give you some, some examples of the sorts of things that people are printing today, real products, not tools, not patterns, not prototypes. First of all, business. Why would I want to 3D print something? Why would I not want to mold something or machine something? Why do I want to print it? And There's a number of reasons, and the first one is economics. I can make a million things slightly different on my 3D printing machine for the same cost as make a million things the same. Now, there isn't any other manufacturing process that allows me to do that. I can make individual unit volumes of one cost-effectively. I can also make really complicated shapes with no economic penalty. So, if you think about machining, the more complicated your object's machining, the more expensive your machining is because it takes longer to machine, it takes you longer to plan the path of your machine tool. Um, if you're molding something, the more complicated it is, the more cores you have to have in your tool, the more expensive it becomes. In 3D printing, complexity of geometry is not related to economics. I can also make very functional parts, and I'll give you some examples of that. Product personalization is, is really important in, in 3D printing at the moment, because there's seven billion people and we're all a different size and shape. So we are a unit of one, and we're all a really complicated geometry. So 3D printing is perfect for making people-focused products. The environment, I'll give you some examples of environmental business benefit. And a number of our clients in the aerospace world, the primary reason they're using 3D printing is to reduce the amount of raw material and to reduce the weight of their aircraft, which then reduces the fuel consumption and the CO2 emissions. And then new business models and new supply chains. So I'll give you some examples. So low volume production. Why am I going to print something? I'm going to print it because I don't have to invest in tooling. I don't have to make a mold tool. I don't have to make jigs and fixtures. I don't have to invest in any of that capital investment or inventory. I don't have to hold stock. I can print to order. Um, I simplify my supply chain. So there's a lot of economic reasons. I'll give you one really nice case study. So this is a, a, a Bentley Continental. Who has a Bentley Continental? These guys are going to within a couple of years. He's got his eye on one already, I can tell. So, so Bentley make, I'm sure you're aware, Bentley's part of the Volkswagen Group. Luxury cars, quarter of a million to well over a million US dollars. They use additive 3D printing in-house all the time, have done for product development for years and years and years. And in the last five or six years, they've used it for making parts of cars as well. So I'll give you an example. They had a customer. Uh, in the USA, who unfortunately had had uh, a stroke, had had paralysis on one side of his body. He could still drive, he had a license to drive, but he couldn't use one hand. And the problem with this is that the only thing on this side of the steering wheel is the starter button. So he can drive the Bentley, he wants the Bentley, he has the money for the Bentley, but he can't start the Bentley. So the Bentley solution is pretty simple, it's designed in CAD. So we'll get the CAD file, we'll move the starter button to the other side of the dashboard. We'll move the dials to make some room, and then we'll 3D print the dashboard. Because we're gonna cover it with leather, we're gonna cover it with walnut, you're never going to know that what's underneath is 3D printed. And because we're only gonna make one, European car legislation says that we don't have to put it through testing, because it's a unique one-off. So this is now how Bentley is customizing its vehicles. The net effect here is that component part cost them about 400 US dollars and they charged the customer 25,000. But he had a solution. So again, think, how do you use this to give somebody a solution? So the actual 3D printed part, if you ever see these, the 3D printed part is a higher quality than the original resin molding. 
If you put them next to one another, the 3D part's better. Design complexity. We can make really, really complicated shapes. And that has a number of benefits to us in, in the business. Again, another example, and it's, it's a bit of an engineering, it's quite a dull example, actually. In fact, it's really dull. Um, it's a diesel pump. It's part of an engine, engine for car. Typically, when you make these things, you cast them. So it's a squeeze cast aluminium part that has a load of holes drilled through it. And then when you've drilled the hole through, you have to put a blanking um, bearing in the end. You press a ball bearing in the end. Hope that the, that, the, that the diesel fuel doesn't leak out. And you do some deburring inside, and you end up with a fuel pump. It doesn't work very well, because you've got lots of holes that go around square corners. What you really want is your holes to be conformal and have a better product, a more functional product. So we did some work with Delphi on this, and the idea was a bit different. We said, well, what do you want it to do? And they said, we want it to be some holes to transfer liquid. OK. Well, let's start with the holes and then add the material around them. Because that way, we can make an optimized product. We can use the least amount of raw material. You don't have to have holes that do this. You can have holes that conform and flow. Uh, and the net effect of this was a 3D printed part that actually weighs less, has lower pressure drop across it, because the holes are not going around big square corners. It's a more optimum product. And it's a complex product in terms of its geometric uh, design. So we've carried on working with Delphi on this to try and make these things smaller and smaller and smaller. Because one of the big issues in automotive is trying to get things lighter weight and get more and more under the bonnet of a car. I saw this in Stockholm a couple of weeks ago. And I think this is a really good example of complexity. Again, printing really complicated things. This is a 3D printed, it's some sort of gripper, suction gripper off a production line. I've got no idea what it picks up. You've got some sort of rubber cups on the end, it obviously comes down on top of something, picks it up, moves it on a production line. But if you look at it, it's all 3D printed. With all of the hydraulic, uh, sorry, all of the pneumatic airflow paths are inside it. It's a single piece. It's not an assembly. And it's been 3D printed. Well, why not? Why not 3D print it? It's probably the most cost-effective way to make it. Because it's really very, very complicated as a shape. Functionality um, is another idea with 3D printing. If I'm making products by 3D printing, I can put more function in them. I can make them better products. So this is where we are now with our Delphi diesel pump. We're making it so small that it's getting hotter and hotter and hotter. So we're starting to design things like heat exchangers onto the surface. Because I can make this shape just as cheaply as making a solid. In fact, that's more cost effective. It's cheaper to make that because there's not as much scanning in my 3D printing machine. Energy absorbency. One of the things that we've been looking at recently is, can I design structures by 3D printing that absorb energy? So in the automotive industry, crash protection is a really big issue. And at the moment, a lot of crash protection is done through these expanded metal foams. But I don't know how they're going to compress. If I crash my car, well, might be OK, might not. Depends. If you drive with Ulf, whew. <laughs> I was watching that. <laughs> So I was watching. But we could, we could design these sorts of structures. And if you put that in a, in a compressive testing machine, you can actually predict the way it will absorb energy and the way that it will compress. So again, this is the idea of functionality. Can I make it more than just a geometry? Can I make a 3D printed object that has more value? I'm going to give you an example, hip implants. About 40,000 hip implants were 3D printed last year and implanted into people. So this idea that this is a future technology for the future isn't quite true. There are applications of 3D printing today that happen in reality. And the reason this works, and the reason we're doing this, is that hip implants have to have a rough surface, because the bone has to grow around something. And if you look at a traditional hip implant, it's, it's a piece of titanium that's drop-forged, machined, and then it has a, a, a ceramic coating put on it. And the ceramic coating costs a lot of money. It costs more to put the ceramic on the hip implant than to make the hip implant. So the 3D printing solution is, well, why have the ceramic? I'll make a surface texture on my 3D printed part that the bone can grow into. And that will have a, an economic benefit. And it, and it certainly does. If you look at the economics of making hip implants, uh, the average hip implant sells for about 6,000 US dollars. If you look at the cost of making them, you've got about $1,700 to play with for your manufacturing costs. Costs us about $150 to 3D print a titanium hip implant. 
So it's as cost effective, if not more cost effective, than traditionally making them. Um, and, and again, this idea that 3D printers are very slow machines that you use for one-off parts is not so true. I can make 108 hip implants in 95 hours on a machine that I just leave. I set it going and I leave it alone. So I can make nearly 7,500 hip implants a year on one 3D printer. And at the moment, these parts are not customized parts. They're not for individual patients. They're just made for stock because it's cheaper than making them traditionally. But I can customize things. There are lots and lots of products that are already 3D printed. Hearing aids, in the ear hearing aids. Last year, there were 12 million 3D printed. There were only 18 million hearing aids made last year. So we already make 60% of the world's hearing aids because it's the most cost-effective way of making them. They work out about three bucks a piece to 3D print a hearing aid shell. It's far more cost-effective than making them traditionally. Prosthetic limbs, glasses. There's a company now uh, in, uh, where are they, Belgium, um, Luxexcel, who've developed a way of printing lenses. So they can 3D print the lens and the glasses at the same time and personalize it to the individual consumer. So you can decide the shape you want the glasses. You can design them yourself. Go online and design them. There's lots of companies developing apps for things like iPads and iPhones where you can be the designer of the product. So you go and slide a few little slider bars and change the, change the glasses, make the frames bigger, smaller, fatter, thinner, within constraints. So the designer sets the constraints of what you can do and then lets you go and do it. So these are some guys we work with in London who have a, a, a project called Makey Doll. And these are 3D printed dolls, uh, which sounds simple, sounds a bit silly and trivial. The people behind this were behind Moshi Monsters and Facebook. And what they're doing is building a virtual online, um, how should we put it? It's a social networking site for kids where they can design their own avatar characters and play within their own safe world. And everything in that safe world is 3D printable. And the whole business is built on the ability to 3D print the content. And what they're doing is developing apps that let you design all these products. So that might seem trivial, but if you apply that to glasses or you apply it to other consumer goods, that's the world that we're starting to move into, putting the internet with 3D printing. And there's lots of ways of doing it. We can scan things, we can photograph things. I'm going to touch on sustainability as a business driver. If you look at manufacturing, if you look at, certainly within the aerospace industry, one of the biggest issues in aerospace at the moment, apart from CO2 emissions, is raw materials. There isn't enough titanium in the world to service the order book of Boeing and Airbus together. So if you look at the number of aircraft Boeing have sold over the next 20 years, and Airbus, add them together, and look at how many thousands of tons of titanium they need, and then look at all the titanium manufacturing mills around the world, there isn't enough. So we've got to find other ways of making products. And one way that the aerospace guys are, are, are doing this is 3D printing. You use powder and consolidate it together into parts. The other reason they're doing it is it can make really lightweight objects. And I'm going to give you an example. This is, this is something we did with Virgin Atlantic. Um, so does anyone ever been in there? hope not. It's the first class cabin. Come on, admit it. Who goes in the first class cabin? There you go. Ulf, it's all Ulf. So this, that's the first class cabin in a Virgin Atlantic. Okay, so if you, if you pull the monitor out, you'll see there's an arm here. Okay, it's at the moment machined from a solid lump of aluminium. Okay, that's, that's, that's the little beastie there. Um, I think it's about 3.7 kilo lump of aluminium, which gets reduced down to about 800 grams. And the rest is waste. Okay, now for aerospace, we, we call it buy to fly ratio. That's quite a small buy-to-fly ratio. The worst one we've ever seen was 237 to 1. So for every 237 kilos of titanium, the product weighed 1 kilo and the rest was waste. Okay, and that's not uncommon. So Virgin said, what we want to do is we want to 3D print this. Uh, we want it to be ultra-light, ultra-efficient, and use the least amount of material. So the two ways that we did it, we said, well, we could make a lattice structure because it doesn't cost me any more money. As I said, I can make really complicated shapes. Or I can optimize it. I can make the perfect strength to weight. I can design the product around the constraints of the product. So what happens is you end up taking a 0.8 kilo part down to 310 grams. 
Now, that doesn't sound a lot, but in aerospace terms, taking out half a kilo of weight on a single component part is a really big issue, and I'll, I'll give you an idea why. If you look at the carbon footprint of this, I won't bore you with carbon footprinting, but we use a lot less raw material in our 3D printing world than machining. So we actually have a huge environmental saving. If I was to machine that from a 3.2 kilo billet of material, I'd use about 760 megajoules of energy. If I 3D print, I use 105. So I use much less energy making uh, material for 3D printing. If you look at it over the life cycle, though, it's quite interesting that the, the raw material, 3D printing, I make a saving. Machining is actually far more efficient than, than 3D printing. 3D printing machines are really slow and they use lots of energy. Distribution, forget it. It doesn't matter where you make things in the world. We have no end of ships sailing around the world. It doesn't really have an impact on, uh, on the environment. What has an impact is the weight of something. So I said I've, I've reduced the weight of my little aerospace component by 500 grams. I reduced the CO2 by, ooh, crikey, what's that, 27 tonnes of CO2 emitted from that aircraft just by reducing the weight of one part. You have to remember, why do, why do aircraft emit CO2? Well, they emit CO2 because you burn fuel. Okay, and, and, and this is where it gets interesting. A one kilogram reduction in weight saves $3,000 in fuel a year to an airline. So if I'm Virgin Atlantic or um, SAS or Wiz or Ryanair or whoever, um, I want my planes to weigh the absolute bare minimum because I pay for weight through fuel. So when you look at this in context, it's interesting. One, one kilo is $3,000 um, $3, of fuel a year. That's $90,000 over the 30 years of an aircraft life. So if you could reduce an aircraft by 150 kilos, so bear in mind I've knocked half a kilo off the weight of just that one component, um, I'd save $13.5 million of fuel. So over all of the aircraft that are in the EADS order book, which is 26,000 new aircraft they've already got orders for, over the next 20 years. That's $3.5 billion of fuel. So reducing the weight of components is, is, is absolutely paramount to, uh, to the airline industry. So if you go back to our little part, we save nearly a kilo, yeah? A kilo weight saving in a part is $1,500 of fuel saving a year. Over the aircraft, life $45,000. That part doesn't stay on the aircraft for the life of the aircraft. Airlines change the seats every seven years. Because in first class, it's all about having the best first class cabin. Nobody is brand loyal in first class. So you might fly with Emirates this week, but if Thai Airlines has a new first class cabin next week and you can afford it, you'll go to Thai Airlines and then you'll go to SAS and then to British Airways and whoever. So every seven years, they change the seats. So if you do the economics here, it's quite interesting. The machine part is $500. That's all it costs to make. My 3D printed part's $2,500. So Virgin is saying, why should I pay you five times more money for a 3D printed part for, for an aircraft? And we're saying, well, actually, because you get your money back in two years through fuel saving. So we did a project two years ago with a company who are now giving the parts to the airlines. So this is a completely different business model for an engineering company. I'm not going to sell you something. I'm going to give it to you. And then you give me half the fuel saving. You keep half. I take half. I give you the part. That's a very different business model for a manufacturing company. But it's a step change. That's a typical aerospace bracket off a of Boeing 777. That's what it looks like if you 3D print it in its optimum form. That is a very, very tough pill to swallow for an aerospace company because it doesn't really look like an engineered product anymore. It looks like a tree root, which is quite surprising not because actually nature has spent millions of years developing optimized structures and that's what our computer says is the optimum of that. And I kind of believe our computer. So uh, supply chains. Let's just finish off on supply chains. We're talking about why we use 3D printing. What does it give us in a business that we can't get otherwise? Chainless supply chains is something that maybe one day will happen. This idea of home manufacture. There is no supply chain. I'll give you a, just a very quick example of this. There's a, a company called Fresh Fiber, who, if you remember, I think four or five years ago when the iPhone 4 came out, if anyone had an iPhone 4 and they were left-handed, and it didn't work. Do you remember this? 
was the, when the iPhone came out, if you were left-handed, uh, your hand was over the antenna. And it didn't work. There was no signal. And people started complaining. And Steve Jobs didn't care. Uh, you know, become right-handed. Okay? You know, change, change your psyche. Because that's kind of his thing. So phone cases started appearing. So who's got a phone case? There must be people who've got a phone case. Yeah? We never used to have phone cases, did we? Phones are in cases already. It's the most illogical object in the world is a phone case. The phone case industry is worth billions of dollars now, and it's all because the iPhone didn't work, and the only way to make it work was to put it in a case. So when this happened, lots of companies jumped on this and said, well, I'm going to start making phone cases. So they designed some phone cases. They then send their designs off to the Far East, get some quotes for some injection mold tooling, agree on a price for an injection mold tool, commit to the tooling. Somebody makes the tooling, takes them six to eight weeks. Then they say, well, you've got to buy at least 500,000 or it's not worth our while. So then somebody injection molds 500,000, puts them in a shipping container, sticks them on a ship, and spends 14 weeks getting them back to Europe. By which time, everyone's kind of getting a bit fed up that their phone doesn't work. Two Apple guys said, well, this, there's, a, there's another way. We're going to jump ship. We're going to leave Apple and set up a company 3D printing phone cases. We're not going to make them until we've got the orders. What we'll do is we'll design them, we'll put them on the internet, and when people start getting their credit cards out and buying them, then we'll send the files away and get them printed. And we'll ship them to you. And you'll get them in a week. And you'll be happy because you got your phone case 17 weeks before anybody else. We're happy because we've got no capital investment whatsoever. The guy who's printing these for us is really happy because he's getting loads of orders for things that he wasn't ever going to 3D print. So Fundamentally, everyone's happy. Um, within a year, they got that to a $36 million company and sold it. So, very nice little business startup, very, very rapid growth. And the whole, the whole business is predicated on this idea of rapid retail thinking. I can 3D print things and get them to consumers much quicker than we can use a traditional supply chain. Figure Prints is, is another similar example. This is a company that, that 3D prints computer games characters that links computer games to 3D printers and ships you the characters through the post. These guys did buy some machines. They, they spent about, I guess, about $300,000 on machines and were turning over $6 million in a year just printing off games characters. Um, so a little niche, but a niche that's actually quite a valuable niche for a small business. So if we summarize where we are today, I think rapid prototyping is valuable. It's a really valuable tool. We, we can't get away from that. Um, but you have to think about the parts you want to make. What are the things you want to make with this technology? Are they prototypes, end-use parts? I think you've got to look beyond just making an object. Look at what that object could do for you. Is it a product? Is it a pattern? Is it a tool? Um, exploit the business benefits. What about the future? Well, if you've ever seen this, something called the Gartner Hype Curve. Gartner is a US consulting firm. And every year, they plot all the amazing things in society quantum computing and bioprinting, and, and, and they call it uh, the peak of inflated expectation. And they say that's where we are with 3D printing. We're right at the top. So we've all been told by the media it's going to change our world, yeah? And, and within the next year, we're all going to come down here to the trough of disillusionment. We're all going to become really disillusioned about 3D printing. You don't want to hear this, okay? Because it's not going to do all the things that we were told it will do. And then we're going to start going up here, up the slope of enlightenment. And that's interesting, because that's actually where enterprise 3D printing is. That's consumer 3D printing. Enterprise 3D printing is here. It's already going up this slope towards productivity. Yeah, we've got through this. We, we did this a few years ago, all the things that were wrong with it. But actually now, we're starting to see it becoming a productive technology. But the industry is changing. What used to cost half a million dollars now costs uh, $3,000. $150,000 is $4,000. So we are seeing some shifts, some changes. Now, these machines are not as good as these machines, but they're getting better. Now, these changes in economics make this a lot more viable to people. Material cost, big issue. At the moment, we can pay anything up to $300 a kilogram for the material we use. It actually only costs $2.5 a kilogram. So there's going to be some shift in the, in, the, in the economics of this as well. And machines are getting better. So if you look at these little home consumer 3D printers, um, some of the companies like MakerBot have only been around since 2008. 
they started off with machines that looked like this and very rapidly innovated new machines that were far more functional. And they did it much quicker. First product iteration, 18 months, 14 months, 10 months, 4 months. And then they sold their business for $600 million, which is not a bad, a bad uh, what's that, four years' work. So what we're predicting, and this is just a prediction, is that in the next 10 years, we're going to see convergence of consumer 3D printing and industrial 3D printing. It will become the same thing. Consumer machines will get better, more functional. They'll probably get a little bit more expensive. Professional machines will come down in price. They'll be more accessible. So what does it mean for you guys if you're in manufacturing? We, we did a study earlier this year with IBM looking at what happens if you take a robot and a 3D printing machine and open source electronics. So if anyone's been following the, this idea of open source electronics, Arduinos, Raspberry Pis, electronic devices you can buy for $10, at the moment, you could buy a controller, an Arduino controller, for about $8. That's cheaper than the controller that's inside my washing machine. Okay, so what would happen if I put an open source Arduino in a Bosch washing machine, printed it out, and assembled it with a robot? Because isn't that where the world's going to be in 10 years' time? Or a Samsung television, or a Philips Razor, or an Apple iPhone? So we spent a year working with IBM on this, saying, well, okay, well, is that feasible? What would happen? What does that future look like? I'll skip through this a little bit, but what we did <coughs> was took a washing machine. Uh, the bloke in the shop was really happy because I bought the most expensive Bosch washing machine in the whole of the United Kingdom, and within a day, we took it to pieces. So that was a salesman's dream, and as you can see, that's what happens to it. Um, and then what's interesting is you look at it and say, okay, we've just destroyed a, a 1,600 euro Bosch washing machine, um, and you look at what can you 3D print. And actually, you can't 3D print very much of it at all using current technology. But you CAD it up anyway, and you get someone in the office to, to, to reverse engineer all of this. And then you start saying, what if I 3D printed it and didn't mold it? So you look around and say, well, what does it do as a product? Is it structurally loaded? Does it have to touch water? Does it get hot? Is it conductive? Is it electrical? And then you look at all the 3D printing machines in the world and say, which is the best one? to make this product on, and put it through some software and do some roadmaps. And what comes out the other end is quite interesting. That Bosch washing machine, the bill of materials at the moment is $310. That's all. If I tried to 3D print it, it would cost $12,000. So am I going to make 3D printing washing machines? It's unfeasible, economically unviable. But if you look at where 3D printing is going, the trajectory of it, the economics change in the next five years the cost of 3D printing a washing machine comes down to about $500. In 10 years' time, it comes down to $318. It's as cheap to 3D print the components that are printable than it is to mold them. Some of the other products we looked at were even more compelling. Samsung televisions. Um, I can 3D print a Samsung television within five years' time for the same price I can, print, I can injection mold it today. The difference is when Samsung makes a television, it tools up to make 400,000. I can make one, and I can change that design for different consumers. iPhones, it's an interesting one. Your, your iPhone, we, we managed to find out how much these things cost to make, and um, it's a little bit well, profiteering, is one word. Um, they're not expensive to make at all. Um, the bill of materials is about $202. Um, if you look at what you can 3D print and what you can't, unfortunately, you can only 3D print about $7 worth of an iPhone. Um, so maybe in the future we might 3D print it, we might not. At the moment, it costs $123 to 3D print that in metal compared to $7 to machine it in aluminium. Within 10 years' time, it'll be cheaper to 3D print it in metal. Hearing aids, we'll come back to this. because We talked about hearing aids earlier. Hearing aids was really interesting for us because we looked at this and said, can you 3D print a hearing aid? Well, we already 3D print hearing aids, but we only print the plastic part. And the plastic part of a hearing aid is worth $3. The rest of it costs $310. The amplifier, the speaker, the microphone, the electronics, the wiring, the battery. So we looked at 3D printing and looked at where it is today and then looked at what's called 2D functional printing. There's lots of work going on in the world to 2D print functional material. So print cardboard boxes that have conductive ink all over them. If you take that idea and apply it to 3D printing, we can print objects already, and we do this in our lab. 
Uh, we have a machine that has seven different print heads with different metals, different polymers printing together. We can print a battery already. We can print a speaker. I can already print a microphone. So within 10 years' time, I can condense all of that down and print a hearing aid. And then it becomes really interesting because my cost of 3D printing is only $12 in 10 years' time. The cost of the overall hearing aid comes down to $100 from $300. So some products in the future will have massive change in their supply chain by 3D printing. So that was an hour. So let's just summarize. Um, don't promise your wife or mother a 3D printed washing machine unless you know she's going to live till 2023. That's a good start. Okay. You can, if he's going to live that long as well. <laughs> nope. <laughs> so, and, and again, there was a serious side to this. When we looked at washing machines, the idea was that if you look at Bosch, Bosch make pretty standard washing machines by the hundreds of thousands. Now, if you're a single person on your own, do you need a seven kilogram load washing machine? Or equally, if you've got four children, is a seven kilogram washing machine big enough? Or if you run a guest house with five bedrooms and you're washing towels every day, do you want something bigger or smaller? I live in a 400 year old house. No wall is the right angle. Yeah? This idea that everything needs to be 600 millimeters wide, 800 millimeters high, 500 millimeters deep, that's the European standard for domestic appliances. It's useless in a 400 year old house. Yeah? So what we were looking at is, can I, can, I, can I have a 537 millimeter wide washing machine? That's the idea with 3D printing. Um, LCD screens, yeah, I think you could probably look at how you're going to customize it in your lounge within five years. If you make iPhone cases, start worrying. I don't know if anyone here makes iPhone cases, but if you make metal things that are complex and small, consider very carefully the future in terms of 3D printing. I think one thing I would say just as a parting, uh, parting words is take this very seriously. There's a lot of hype in the media about 3D printing. But actually, the way it's being adopted by industry, it is changing companies. And it's certainly changing companies involved in high-value, low-volume manufacturing. So if you make expensive products today, and you make them in relatively low volumes, start looking at 3D printing very seriously as a way of making things in the future. I think if you make anything, for goodness sake, consider rapid prototyping. Because if you are developing and bringing products to market today, and you're not rapid prototyping, you're really missing a trick because it's such an accessible technology that reduces the, or compresses the supply chain, reduces lead times. Um, and I don't think it matters what industry you're in. You could be a boat builder, you could be an architect, you could be making forestry machinery, you could be making chainsaws. Rapid prototyping should sit in your product development process. Is it worth being part of it? At the moment, the whole additive industry is about $2.1 billion. It's projected to grow to about $8 billion by 2020. And the interesting number here for us is that one. We only penetrate 8% of the market opportunity by 3D printing. If more companies knew about 3D printing, if more companies were using it, this is a $100 billion market. That's a third of the aerospace sector. So 3D printing is an important part of any, any economy, any ecosystem, and it should be part of any company. That's an hour. I'm going to stop now because I need a drink. Um, I hope that was useful. I hope it was informative. Um, I'm more than happy to take any questions. I'm going to come back to the, the 3D print center with these guys. So if anyone's got any questions you want to take offline, I'd be happy to, to field them. If anyone has any questions now, feel free. Just don't ask me in Swedish, please. Do anything, please. How safe? Yeah. I, it, at the end of the day, it all depends on the part and how it's been how it's been made. So, if the part's been designed to be 3D printed, then it's probably a lot safer than if you try to copy something that was made by machining. So that that's the concern of a lot of companies, the BMWs of this world. If they've designed it to be 3D printed and it gets 3D printed again, that's okay. But if someone tries to use 3D printing to make something that was machined, that could be a problem. But saying that, material properties uh, for, for laser melt, for, for metal 3D printing, our mechanical properties are, I would always say, better than cast and almost as good as wrought. So we get 99.8 to 99.99% .99 density of metal. So it's, it's 
Pretty good stuff. Yeah, I mean, in, term, well, in terms of mechanical properties, so 98 to 99% the same as a wrought part. So if you look at titanium, um, laser melted titanium is about nine, 990 MPa, and that compares to wrought titanium at what, 110 MPa? Oh, sorry, 1,100 MPa. So we have, we have usable mechanical properties now, which we didn't have 10 years ago. Hello. Yes. <laughs> Hello. Uh, when when um, do you think we will see machines for um, printed electronics? You said you have it in your lab, mm -hmm. but when will it be on the market? I think for something as complex as a hearing aid, it will be 10 years. I think for something as complex as putting conductive material inside a polymer, three. So for low voltage. So if you want to put electronic tracks inside a plastic component for a housing for a, uh, a mobile phone or whatever, then conceptually three years. But then, you know, the more complicated the system, the smaller the system, the longer it will, it will take us. I don't think we'll ever get to the point where we, we 3D print integrated circuits and computers and whole phones. It's, it's illogical. They're too small, too small. Yeah, we can, make it, uh, soft. yeah, we can polish the, the... There are a number of polishing techniques um, that are quite traditional. They've been developed for many, many years that allow us to... Um, one uses an abrasive-loaded liquid that we can push through the hole, uh, and it has like a diamond uh, grit in the liquid, and that will polish the inside of the hole, just the inside of the hole. So, um, and to give you an, uh, an idea of that, GE have just bought 30 machines to make... Um, fuel nozzles for their leap engine um, and they're all 3D printed components and they will have to polish the inside of all those holes but it's much easier to polish because it's a, it's a consistent roughness uh, What kind of tolerance do you have today uh, on, the, on the parts? Is no, it not 10 or or yeah. or It depends which process and it depends whether it's scalar so, so on obviously larger parts we start to lose tolerance. We can print, the smallest thing we can print is 360 nanometers. So very, very tiny, plus or minus two or three nanometers. So if you're making microelectronics, then we're within a, within a nanometer scale. On a, on a laser melting machine, I would say plus or minus 50 microns. So we're not down to those tolerances that we can get with machining. That's one of the downsides of this. Um, on polymer machines, it's nearer to 70 microns. So, so you have to take that into consideration in the design process. Okay. Could I? Hi. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I, don't think I don't think I knew that. Uh, okay, I was wondering about the software aspect of this, um, because I know there are a lot of 3D programs that are not very intuitive. So I was just asking, wondering, would could I, could I design things in, in ZBrush or Sculptris? Or is it other software I have to use? No, absolutely. ZBrush. If, you know how to Z, if you know how to use ZBrush, you're better than most people I know. Because that's a, <laughs> that's a really tough package to use. But it's an art, it's, it's a design, it's an art design package. No, ZBrush outputs STL files. If you had some ZBrush files, I would implore you to talk to Ulf. Because what you can design is far better than any of the samples he has in his office. Okay. <laughs> no, seriously. I mean, Z ZBrush produces amazing photorealistic characters and, and artifacts. So, yeah. And the other thing is haptic control interfaces. If you've seen the haptic arms that you can get, they produce wonderful parts. So it doesn't have to be CAD at all. If you go to your Save As options, there'll be in your drop down there'll be something called STL or PLY or what's the Zcore native input format. ZPR, yeah. They'll all be save as options in ZBrush. 
and that would allow you to export files directly to a 3D printer. I, I, yeah, I agree. I, I, I do have a little caveat, though. I don't, I don't think it matters how easy design software is. Not everybody will be a designer. Because we can all use a word processor, but if you read one of my books, it's not Shakespeare. Yeah, and I think, no, but seriously, I think design is the same. Just because, because software is usable doesn't make us all Johnny Ives or Philip Stark or whoever. You have to have a creative mind to be a designer. Yeah, I'd like to add something about that, but we can take that later. I mean, since, since I give lectures and helping people become artists, and I'm helping everyone realize the... I mean, many people in here might say, I can only draw a stick figure, uh, and that's exactly what I work with, helping people to understand they have a creative mind. So, but we can take that later. <laughs> yeah. Show a picture about the stainless steel, and titanium, mm -hmm. and aluminium. Are they weldable? After this process? Absolutely. We always say if, if a material is weldable, then it will work in this process. So it has to, if I just go back to that, God, a lot of slides. Here we go. Yeah, it, metal, metal additive works better for materials that are weldable in the first place. So most, most metallic additive parts, when you finish making them, you would post process machine them to get that tolerance. So you have to take that into consideration. So you'd overbuild and machine back. But yeah, you can weld them. You can do a lot of build up if you have to. So if you damage them, you can, you can weld back on the surface. Uh, and there are materials. I mean, one that I've not put on there is uh, titanium aluminide, which is a material that you can't cast, you can't machine, but you can 3D print with it. So there are some materials that we're developing that are only 3D printable. Uh, how many different kinds of materials can you combine when you 3D print? At the moment, not enough. <laughs> not many. So that there is one, um, there's one machine from a company in Israel that can combine different polymers at the same time. So you can have a rigid polymer with a, um, a flexible polymer. Or you could have different colours of polymers. But that's pretty much the limitation. As I say, in the next five years, we're going to see more multi-material 3D printing. So this idea that you can combine metal with metal and polymer to make a conductive and insulating material. But at the moment, in one machine, you're very limited. One more question about the metal. Yeah. Uh, maybe similar to the welding. Are they heat treatment? Could you put heat treatment on those, like hardening? Yeah, and in most cases we do, certainly with titanium, we tend to hip things and case harden them. Depends what the part is. Depends what surface metallurgy you need. But think, think, of, think of the metals as being the same as a traditionally wrought metal. You can do the same things in terms of machining, post-process treatments, heat treatments, quenching. Yeah. Is it possible to blend uh, colors into different layers, or do you have to... Oh, I think you're going to... We'll have a demonstration of that if we go back down the road. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, print, print, there are machines that are printed for color. These guys have a machine that prints... Yeah, in, how, is it four million? Six. Six million colors. So. That's enough for anybody. Yeah. You're just being greedy if you want more than six. <laughs> okay. I hand back, I don't, back to all four... Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, Thank you let's take it back to the office. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. till oss om ni vill titta mer på skrivare och vi bjuder gärna på en glas dricka och lite ja. Eh, förlåt, mitt emot systembolaget. <laughs> Kvarngatan 7. Eh, där håller vi till. Så välkomna. Tack.